Well, good morning. Thank you so much for joining the live stream of Living Grace Evangelical Church. Uh, wherever you are and whatever time you're watching this, whether it's right now with us on Sunday mornings or whether it's later on during the week or at another time, we're just so happy that you've joined us this morning for worship. <music>
hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of His wind and mercy And all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great Affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. for me Loves like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of His wind and mercy And all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how final two weeks here in this uh, series in Genesis that we've been digging into the book of Genesis, and uh, we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph. It's interesting, Joseph, his story, his account of his life, that narrative begins in chapter 37, and actually goes to the end of the book of Genesis, chapter 50, 
And so really, if you count it all together, Joseph's story in the book of Genesis accounts for nearly 25% of the book. And so Joseph is a major character in the book of Genesis. But before we get there to where we're going today, we have to kind of do some background and we have to figure out a little bit more about Joseph. And we got to start all the way back with Jacob. And uh, as we recall last week, Jacob uh, was on his way, you know, as Joseph's father, Jacob is on his way back to his homeland. The Lord had called him out of, out of where he was at and his kind of sojourning and, and called him back to his homeland. And so Joseph, at the time of this travel that we looked at last week of the travel that Jacob was on and meeting Esau, uh, Joseph at this time is, is six years old. And so now when we fast forward to Genesis 37, where we're going to start today, where Joseph's story, his story really picks up, uh, Joseph is 17 years old. Now, Joseph, he, he had a, you know, obviously Jacob's, you know, family was a little different dynamic. He had technically two wives and two concubines, so four wives altogether who had children. And so it was a really big family. Uh, but Jacob, uh, you know, his sons, obviously there are 12 of them. Now, now when we think of Joseph, Joseph had a full brother. His name was Benjamin, and they were both the sons of Rachel. Now, as you recall, Rachel was the wife that jo- Jacob labored for for seven years until Laban kind of you know flipped the script on him and tricked him, and he had to labor another seven years under Laban for her hand in marriage. And so, for a total of fourteen years, Jacob had to you know work for Laban for Rachel's hand in marriage. Now, we're told in Genesis 35 that Rachel died while giving birth to Benjamin. This would have been around the time that Joseph was probably about 10 years old. And so this is kind of the background context that we find in the life of Joseph. And so we're going to pick up Joseph's story here in Genesis 37, 1 through 4. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, could not speak peacefully to him. Now that that interesting thing that gift that you know is given to Joseph of that robe of many colors. There's other translations that talk about this robe and many commentaries that talk about this robe probably meaning the many colors actually probably meaning it was a robe with long sleeves. And so if you think about it, a robe with long sleeves in a pretty, you know, agrarian culture where you're working a lot with your hands it kind of doesn't make sense for a common laborer. And it's interesting that this gift really from, you know, Israel to Joseph is making a statement. It's a pretty clear message that Joseph is special. He's not a laborer like his brothers. He's management. And it's not something you would expect for number 11 out of 12 boys. And so Jacob's blatant favoritism of Joseph, it provokes the older brothers. And it plays into the next scene as this drama begins to unfold. We're going to pick this up really here in uh, verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he begins then to tell them his dream and essentially it's a dream that basically insinuates that he's going to rule over them. And it, we're told then in verse 8 that they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And so there's conflict arising. Now, dreams during this time period, uh, you know, they were taken very seriously because the common understanding about dreams is that they, div- they were part of the divine realm. And it was like, you know, the gods were telling you what was going to happen in your life. And they were taken very seriously. And that's why this, you know, the drama begins to unfold because now Jacob, uh, you know, Joseph is having dreams basically that he, him being one of the younger kids in the bunch, he's going to be the ruler over his brothers, his older brothers. And they weren't having that, right? That, that was, that inflamed them. That honked them off pretty bad. And so they were pretty upset. 
Now, starting in verse 12, we read kind of the climax of this narrative. And Joseph, he's sent by his father to go check on his brothers. Now, at this time, they were up near Shechem, and the family lived in Hebron. And so basically, uh, this was like about a 50-mile, a little over 50-mile hike. And so Joseph, being 17 years old, uh, this would have taken a couple days at least of him just traveling to even get to the spot. And so it's kind of interesting that, you know, a 17-year-old was sent on such a long journey by themselves. But nonetheless, Joseph is sent to go find his brothers and to give a report to their father. Now, upon arriving at Shechem, he's really, like, doesn't find his brothers. And so actually, you know, he finds out they're actually about 14 more miles north of where he was at. And so he actually, he's on his way to find them. And then this is where we pick up here in verse 18. They saw him, his brothers, from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill them, kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see what will become of his dreams. And so... You know, as you can imagine, Joseph he just kind of nonchalantly, you know, walking, he sees his brothers, gets up to them, and then it happened. They took him and they threw him in the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. And then, verse 25, they sat down to eat. And then they look up and they saw a caravan approaching. And then they decided, hmm, we could sell this guy and make some money and be rid of him. And so they sold him to the Midianite traders that were passing by. And these Midianite traders, they took Joseph to Egypt. And that's where we see the story picking up again in chapter 39 of Genesis. Because now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him and made him an overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. And so we see that even though the brothers, you know, took Joseph and they thought, we're rid of this guy, doesn't matter, we still see that the Lord is with Joseph. And even though he was treated unfairly, unjustly, the Lord was with him. And so he finds himself now in Egypt, and now finds himself providentially in the house of a uh, official of the Pharaoh, and he's been put in charge of the house because the fair, this uh, officer, Potiphar, recognized that the Lord was with Joseph. But there becomes a problem. While working for Potiphar, Joseph catches the eye of Potiphar's wife. And she seeks to entice him. And uh, he repeatedly turns her down. And one day, she eventually then corners him. And in his haste to kind of get away and to flee the situation, he loses his garment. And that garment is then used to falsely accuse Joseph of trying to take advantage of her while no one was around. And it landed Joseph in prison into another pit. Joseph really was a victim of injustice. And, you know, he was treated unfairly. He was paying for a crime he didn't commit. I remember a time in my life where I paid for a crime that I didn't commit. It was first grade. I still hold on to it. It was first grade. And I was falsely accused, and I had to suffer punishment for something that I didn't do. Uh, someone had bought an extra milk and had left it on our table. We had a group desk table, and I wasn't paying attention. The teacher had come up to our table and was asking whose milk that was, and it wasn't mine, but she was asking whose, whose it was. I wasn't paying attention, and somebody next to me elbowed me and told me, like, pointed to the teacher, and and, and told me to raise my hand, and I don't know, I just, I just did. I was in first grade. I raised my hand, and unbeknownst to me, I was incriminating myself, claiming that the milk was mine, but I didn't drink it, and that landed me on the wall at recess. And I suffered for a crime that I did not commit. Now, we all have probably 
suffered for a crime that we didn't commit or faced in an injustice or uh, been treated unfairly, we've all probably experienced this in one way or another. And as Christians, how should we respond to these situations in life? How should we, we respond to these kind of pit situations that we may find ourselves in, like the pit that Jacob or Joseph was in, where he was thrown into a pit, he was treated unfairly, he was paying for a crime that he didn't commit. How do we respond to these kind of pit situations in our lives? We need to know how to deal with the pits of life because in reality, we're going to face them. And so we need to know how to respond and how, how to respond as followers of Jesus. And so I've titled this message, Ain't That the Pits?, and, and, you know, the reason I said that, that was, a, uh, that was actually a, a phrase that my grandma would say to me sometimes when it was an unfair situation. I was complaining to her. She'd just say, well, ain't that the pits, right? So title the message, Ain't That the Pits? And I want to share with you really just some helpful action steps that I think that we can, you know, take to really, you know, work through these situations when we find ourselves in unfair situations or in the pits of life. You know, in those pit type situations, how do we respond? Well, I think that we see some of this play out in Genesis 40. And so that's where we're going to be the rest of the time as we look at this account, this narrative of Joseph. So the first thing is that when you're in the pit, don't regress, reach out to others. When you're in the pit, don't regress, reach out to others. Let's look at Genesis 40, 1 through 7. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. He put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. Now when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? I'm just going to stop right there. Joseph, he's in jail for a crime he didn't commit, right? He's, he's suffering punishment for something he didn't even do. He was imprisoned unjustly. You know, we earlier saw in the account that Joseph was thrown into a pit, into a cistern for collecting water by his brothers who were jealous of him. And he was treated unfairly, right? He was treated unjustly. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Joseph at this point in time, I'm in jail. I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm going to be a little fed up with being in this kind of this pit, suffering for something that I didn't do. Um, you know, the temptation to kind of turn inwardly, to regress, to, you know, just really focus on me and not other people would be pretty strong. But we don't see Joseph doing that. While he's in prison, he's essentially given the position of the keeper, basically, of the jail. He's kind of like second in command. He's like the first prisoner, if you want to say it that way, who's kind of in charge of the other prisoners. And in this passage, we read that he's reaching out to the baker and cup pair who were thrown into prison. Joseph, you know, was involved in serving while he was still being treated unfairly, while he was in the pit, basically. He doesn't regress. He doesn't wallow in self-pity. Instead, he reaches out to others in serving them. And arguably, it could be said that the suffering in the pit really taught him to serve others. And I think that that's a crucial lesson for us as followers of Jesus. When we face those times in life where we're in a pit, maybe we're suffering unjustly or we're being persecuted for something or you know we're being treated unfairly or we're just in a situation that's a really tough situation and we find it very precarious that we're in it, you know, and, and it could teeter either way. When we're in those types of pit situations in life, it could be easy to just say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to focus on myself. But the example, the, what we see here in Joseph's life is to reach out, to, to not turn inwardly or to regress, but to reach out to others, to serve others. And isn't that what Jesus exemplified to us? Mark 10, 45 says that, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, who, you know, 
ultimately knew that, you know, he was going to suffer and die for the sins of others, yet he willingly endured it. He never turned inwardly or complained or regressed or talked about the unfairness of it all. But he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's an example that we follow. The mature Christian responds to the pit situations of life, not by regressing inwardly, but by reaching out and serving others. I think Paul recognized this when he wrote to the Colossian church in Colossians 1.24 because he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I think Paul understood and recognized that his serving the needs of others was serving the body of Christ and that his suffering was imitating what Christ had already done And he was sharing in that suffering and he was kind of, you know, being the physical representation of Christ and suffering on behalf of the Colossian church. In the pits of life, don't don't regress, but reach out and serve others. When we reach out and when we serve others, I think it, it in those, especially in those pit situations in life, It has the power to change us and to change our perspective. It has the power to give us strength if we go about it with the proper focus and the proper understanding. And I think Romans 5, 3 through 5 is a great illustration of that. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That we don't suffer for no reason. When we're suffering for others and serving others in our suffering, God does a work in a transforming property and redeeming our suffering, those pit situations, and helping us to see our suffering as an example of Christ's suffering. And so when you're in the pit, don't regress, but reach out to others and serving. Secondly, when you're in the pit, don't rely on yourself, rely on God. When you're in the pit, don't rely on yourself, rely on God. And I think this is illustrated in Genesis 40, verse 8. They said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. I think in that statement, he's relying on God. He's saying, you know what, God, you've put me here for a reason, I guess. And don't interpretations, you know, isn't that God's realm? And so, you know, please tell me your interpretations. And, you know, I think he's in this moment, he's relying on God to do a work, to do something here. But in those pit situations in life, we must rely on God. God God wants to use those situations. He, He can do immeasurably more than we can ever ask or imagine. I don't think Joseph understood what would transpire from this one account. You know, he could have turned inwardly and not focused, and he could have focused on himself. He could have turned inwardly and not focused on others. But because he he asked the question, what's wrong? It gave him an opportunity to hear the dreams and then to for God to use that to eventually bring him into a position of power in Egypt. But if he was totally regressed and looking at himself, he would have missed the opportunity. And I think that that's the point is that we need to rely on God. God can do a work in those situations that we're facing. And I'm reminded of Romans 8, 28, the promise that we can cling to in those tough times, in those times of suffering, in those pit situations where maybe we're in a pit of despair or we're just in a, a tough spot. Romans 8, 28, for I know for, for we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And so we can take that and we can hold on to that. And I may not know that pit situation that you face right now, but God wants to work in that situation and God can work all things for good. It may not turn out the way that you think it's going to turn out or the way that we might want it to turn out, but God is ultimately working things for our good. 
in any situation that we face. Our response in those pit situations is to rely on God. And when we do this, a great way to do this maybe is, is exemplified in 1 Peter 4.19, where those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. That idea of committing ourselves, going to God, right, relying on Him, and continuing to do good, meaning continuing to walk in obedience to Him, continuing to reach out to others, continuing to walk in that reliance on Him. I think that God uses that, and God can do, you know, He can, he can work those things for His good, because when we're in the pit, don't rely on yourself, but rely on God. And then finally, when you're in the pit, don't retaliate, rise above. When you're in the pit, don't retaliate. Rise above. Let's look at Genesis 40, uh, verse 9. And just starting here, the, cup, the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph. And, and so then I'm going to fast forward because I think, you know, the, the dream in and of itself is irrelevant for our purposes right now. But he, he tells his dream and then Joseph tells him the interpretation. And then he, then he basically says, the only thing I'm asking is just remember me because I'm here. I'm suffering in this pit. I didn't do anything. This is unjust. Like, remember me and plead my case to Pharaoh. And so the way that Joseph interprets the dream, it happens. It comes to fruition exactly as he said. But we're told in verse 23, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. He didn't remember him, but he forgot him. And Joseph, he's still in jail. The person that he helped, you know, forgot about him. And Joseph would stay in jail for another two years before the cupbearer to Pharaoh would finally remember Joseph and remember the situation. Now, we're told about that in Genesis 41, where he finally remembers Joseph when Pharaoh has a disturbing dream and Joseph interprets the dream for him. And Pharaoh then basically puts Joseph in second in command over all of Egypt. Now it's at that point, Joseph has immense power now. He could have gotten even, right? He could have retaliated. He could have sought vengeance for himself, but we're not told that he does that. Arguably, we don't see Joseph plotting any sort of vengeance or revenge on his brothers who treated him so unfairly, on Potiphar's wife, who was the reason he was in prison for the time that he was. We don't see him seeking vengeance or retaliation. Every trial that we face, you know, we have a choice. And I think Joseph chose to rise above the situation, to not seek retaliation, but to rise above it because God was doing a work in him and God was cultivating a faith within him. And I think the reality is is that for each and every one of us, that every trial, every pit situation that we face is an opportunity to grow in our faith. I like how author and uh, pastor Tim Keller, uh, he, he said this, Jesus Christ did not suffer so that you would not suffer. He suffered so that when you suffer, you'll become more like him. The gospel does not promise you a better life circumstances. It promises you a better life. I think that that's so crucial to look at is that when we think of revenge and taking vengeance on our own, we're thinking like that is, that is going to make things better. And really, that's the operation of the base reality of our world is retaliation. You know, when you're in the pit, retaliation, that sounds very, very, very appealing. We want to see, we want to feel, we want to revel in the emotional satisfaction that we can get from, you know, watching something like retaliating or taking vengeance, especially if we're being treated unfairly or suffering injustice. We want people to feel how we feel. We, we want them to get what they deserved. You know, we, we want them to face the consequences of their actions. See, this is not the better life that the gospel promises. It's, it's more of the same of what the junk of our world is. It's that's brokenness and marred by sin. But remember, the Bible says and instructs that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, right? That vengeance is God's department, not ours. God has something better. He wants us to rise above. And if I'm 100% honest right now, I see, a, I see a lot of lip service about this. 
that you know God is in control and vengeance is His, and you know He's He's got He's gonna do He's gonna get them, and they're gonna have their comeuppance. Yet the actions of the American church, I think, tell a very different story. I think the faith of many people, it's being sidetracked right now by this obsession on vengeance and retaliation and people getting what they need to get and they deserve. It's not reflecting that better life that the gospel gives us. And the reality is it is a detriment. It's a detriment to the church and it's detriment to the witness of the church. And I think we're seeing that being played out on large scale across America. See, retaliation, vengeance, seeking that, it doesn't make us like Jesus. Because Jesus, he taught on the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And he backed that up with his actions while hanging on the cross by saying to the people who crucified him, Father, praying out to God, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Vengeance, retaliation, all of that, that doesn't make us like Jesus. That's not the better life that God has for us in rising above. See, trials, suffering, the pit situations of life, they're opportunities for us to grow in our faith and they're opportunities for us to become more and more like Jesus. They're opportunities for that better life that's promised by the gospel to be formed and made manifest within me and within my life. I can't help but think of you know Paul's words to the church in Rome in Romans 12. Uh, 14 through 21. Actually, I'm just going to go down to 17 where he says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul's saying, don't retaliate. Rise above. This is the different response to, than the world's response in the pit situations of life, of those times where you face injustice or unfair situations. This Romans 12 here is a glimpse of that better life that's promised by the gospel, It's an in-flesh illustration, really, of that new life that we have in Jesus that's available to us. I want to ask you right now, how are you responding to those pit situations in your life? Maybe you're you're suffering right now from unfairness or, you know, injustice. Maybe you feel that there's a lot of things going on right now and you just kind of feel in this pit and you just feel helpless. How are you responding in the pit situations in your life? Does your response, does it look any different than the world's response? Does it look any different than those who are not following Jesus? What would that look like? What would it look like for you to rise above the pit situations of your life, and to not retaliate. It's an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity for Christ's life to be formed and made manifest within you. When you are in the pit, don't retaliate, but rise above. You know, Psalm 40, it also talks about a pit, and I want to read us in closing from Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord, He inclined to hear me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. See, God wants to lift you out of the pit of destruction that is the result of sin. Sin separates us from God. It makes us enemies of God, and it makes us come under punishment, or under condemnation. Romans 6.23, it tells us the wages of sin is death. What we earn from sin is death. That's a physical death. That's a spiritual death. But thankfully, that verse doesn't stop there. The wages of sin is death, but... It's a transition, a new beginning. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God draws us up out of the pit of sin through Jesus and sets our feet upon the solid rock that is Christ. See, to experience this, it's as easy as ABC. 
A, we have to admit sin. And when we admit sin, we're just agreeing with God about what he says about us. The Bible tells us that all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And so A, we need to admit sin. B, believe that Jesus died for your sins. You know, we can't get out of that pit that sin has us in by trying to do enough good things to build our way back out of that pit. We can't do it. It's too high. The reality is it's only by Christ's shed blood on the cross that our sin can be forgiven and that God himself draws us out of the pit in Christ. And so B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin. And then C, call on Jesus for salvation. Commit to following him. It's a choice that we all have to make. And the great promise of God's word is that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And they can be like this person in Psalm 40 who, who can cry out and who says, I waited patient for, patiently for the Lord. He inclined and he heard my cry. He drew me from the pit of, destru- of destruction. Maybe you're saying, you know what, Tyler, I never knew that that was the case, that I was in this pit and God wants to get me out, but I I want out of this pit. I'm sick of trying to do it on my own. I want to understand that freedom that I have and that release that I have in Jesus. If that's you, I want to encourage you to pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Lord Jesus, come come into my life and save me help me to live for you. And Lord, I pray for each and every one of us in the different pit scenarios that we may find ourselves in. Help us to, from the life of Joseph, emulate the the solid things that we see in his life, Lord, that, you know, he didn't, he didn't turn inwardly, but he reached out in serving others, uh, that he relied on you, not on himself. And Lord, that he also, uh, you know, that he also was very f- firmly attached in understanding, Lord, that you had a plan and that that he could trust in your plan, that he could trust that you had a, a provided a way, and that, Lord, that also that you helped him to understand that, to not retaliate, but to rise above it, Lord. And we see that exemplified in his life. God, help us in the situations we face to do the same, to do likewise, to respond in a Christ-like manner that helps people to see Christ's life within us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stick around and join us uh, briefly after this live stream as we'll be, we'll be doing a Facebook Live where we, we want to hear your prayer requests and things that are going on. want to do a, a slight recap of what we've just talked about with some challenge points and also just some quick announcements. And so we'd love to have you join and, you know, we'd love to be able to pray for your needs. So please, please stick around and join us for our, our Facebook Live shortly after this live stream.